Uh, so flea beetles are probably the, uh, the interesting pest for entomologists and I guess everybody. Uh, I don't know how much I should tell you to start about flea beetles. Uh, who hasn't uh, uh, heard me talk about biology of flea beetles before? Probably everybody has, so you could probably give the same talk that I'm giving, right? <laughs> but uh, just in case you haven't heard this story about flea beetles, uh, I think flea beetles are the number one pest in the prairies, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I study them, and if you ask Dan Johnson, he would say, no, 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 grasshoppers are the most important pest in the, in the prairies historically. And yes, uh, I guess whatever pest is the most important that year, it depends on the year and where you are. Um, in our case in southern Alberta, we actually haven't had outbreaks of flea beetles for a long time, and I guess I'm getting old enough to, to know this. Um, I think 1999 to 2003, we had, this is when I started working here, uh, we had really bad outbreaks of flea beetles. And you collect 1,000 flea beetles uh, using a sweep net or sticky cars like this, and you'd be lucky to find one striped flea beetle. Now, if you, uh, if you do the same thing, you'll find that uh, in some cases, out of 100 flea beetles, you find 15 that are striped flea beetles. So we, we, we do seem to be getting a shift towards more striped flea beetles. Is that uh, here, Hector? Yeah, that's here. So I, I'm going to pass around some cards here. So these are uh, obviously yellow sticky cards. <laughs> you might, don't get yourself stuck on them because you might become a bug there. <laughs> okay, uh, we have circled the, uh, you know them by heart better than me. Uh, you, we, we put little circles there on the flea beetles and uh, in some cases we have both there. Uh, see if you can spot them. You actually will see that a, a lot of them are striped flea beetles and, and this is quite interesting. Uh, why do we have more striped flea beetles in southern Alberta? And I can tell you this is a pattern that we are seeing throughout the prairies. Uh, traditionally, if you, if you live north of Edmonton, uh, the more humid areas of the parkland, Yes, you would expect to find there that the uh, striped flea beetle will be as common as the crucifer flea beetle, the one that we have, and bite or more, yeah. Uh, by the way, these two species are exotic pests. They're invasive, uh, they're not native, not, not like ligus bugs that are nice native insects. They like to eat everything too. Uh, so flea beetles are exotic pests, but uh, in the last decade or maybe, I think we've had a period of wet years in the in the southern prairies for a while that that probably helped us to reduce with stem soft fly but it uh it, it caused the the strifely beetle to potentially move south a bit more okay that's one hypothesis one idea and it's probably part of the answer the other answer uh, is also quite interesting is that the stripely beetle is not as vulnerable to neonicotinoid insecticides as the crucifer flea beetle so that's another reason why we are seeing a shift. And in fact, if you now go to uh, Winnipeg, where they used to have mostly crucifer flea beetles, you find out that almost 100% or 90% of their flea beetles are striped flea beetles. Uh, if you go to uh, Beaver Lodge or even, even uh, we don't have to go that far, we can just go to Clara's home. And uh, we have a study with, uh, with a brand colony on, on Ligus, and we are finding there there's quite a few striped flea beetles and they're becoming dominant. So, there's definitely that shift. So what that means? Uh, well, there's two, two, two important things. Obviously, the neonic, neonics are not going to help us as much. And we say, well, yes, the, you still have an option. There is uh, Lumiderm as a potential alternative. Uh, how many of you have seen the fields with Lumiderm that are also getting sprayed? Anybody? No? Okay, I guess I'm the only one then. We have a... <laughs> We have a study site just uh, south of uh, Raymond, and uh, this farmer has, has uh, Lumiderm tree canola, and uh, he sprayed the borders, I guess, two passes because the, the damage is high. So the Lumiderm will not provide complete control also. So it, it will help, it will increase the mortality of the uh, striped flea beetle, but it's not, not a foolproof answer. So I guess that brings us to the, uh, oh, forgot another thing that I was going to say it's about having strifely beetles they have a slightly different uh, seasonal activity so this strifely beetle will actually wake up a little bit earlier from overwintering and will start feeding on your canola a little sooner than the crucifer flea beetle so the crucifer crucifer is a little bit more lazy it wakes up 
later on. So now we, we will have the two species that will feed on your canola whatever time you plant it, which is, I guess, not good news. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought too. You were doing so good too. I think, I think the wind picked up. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start right from the beginning. My name is Hector Carcamo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, so I was I was talking about striped and crucifer flea beetles. So if you if you missed if you missed that story, you can come and catch me later. I'll be around the whole day. But uh, anyway, uh, we we uh, I just I'll, uh, I'll give you a kind of a take-home message. Uh, you can remember we used to recommend in the south that uh, you could plant early as early as you can and avoid the flea beetles. Just escape them in time. And if you were living in the Peace River, it would be the opposite, because they have more stripely beetle. But now that we have the two species, we cannot make a recommendation. And usually we really can, don't have a lot of room to play with seeding dates in, in temperate ecoregions in Canada or northern U.S. because you have a very short window. Unless you're using a trap crop, I think that uh, seeding date uh, makes sense. But otherwise it's hard. But if you really hate to spray or hate to use insecticides and say, no, I want to just... Uh, um, plant canola without the seed treatment. Uh, I don't know who is courageous enough to do that. But uh, then, then uh, you could say, okay, I will just plant really early um, April 1st. I had a collaborator one year that, that called his canola the uh, April's full canola. He planted on April 1st, got a nice snow cover and got the best canola around, but uh, it didn't get frost, which is always a bit of a risk. So one, one potential way to escape libellus is to, to change the seeding dates. The other one is to seed very thick. And uh, people in the Pacific Northwest used to do that uh, in the very, very old days before seed treatments. They would just seed the canola very thick, and then you just let the flea beetles thin the crop for you. But nowadays, seed tends to be a little bit pricey. So that, that can be an issue. And uh, that, I guess, is a good way to get into this trial here. Uh, so this is the second year of a study where we are attempting to, uh, uh, first of all, we want to, to see that the threshold that we, we, we are validating are correct. So 25% of cotyledon damage has been the threshold. And we, we had a previous study that we got a lot of data and a lot of very variable data, which is a big challenge with flea beetles. The flea beetles are, can be very patchy. They can move really fast. Uh, if, you, if you're a government worker that don't work on weekends, usually they will, they will eat the trial on the weekend. <laughs> so when you come on Monday, the trial is pretty much gone. So that has happened to us many times. Uh, still, we don't work weekends. <laughs> or I do, anyway. Uh, so, so we have this uh, very variable data. So one objective is to validate the threshold. So we have, uh, and we also want to see if there is some kind of combination of magical seeding uh, uh, or plant density and uh, chemical management that can make sense and help us to manage the flea beetle because it, it might be the case that we might only have foliar insecticides in the future or, well, I'm sure there's something coming down the pipe, but as you all have heard, uh, the neonics are getting reviewed and uh, we, I don't quite understand the, the details of this. Uh, don't ask me about them, but uh, there, there could be some restrictions on the use of this uh, neonic insecticide. So we might rely more on, on foliar insecticides. And I can kind of give you this summary of what we found last year. So we have a plant density of three plants per square foot. Uh, and then we have six and then 12. Uh, how many of you recommend planting uh, 12 kilograms per hectare? anybody anybody six kilograms per hectare you got to do pounds per acre it's pretty pretty, pretty <laughs> close and then okay. we can help five you. five uh five pounds per acre or ten pounds per acre or uh three three or four pounds per acre what what's the typical recommendation that you guys do for uh sitting three to four three to four pounds per acre yeah five hmm? five four to five yeah so I guess I guess I've been told uh, I was kind of scolded by Autumn the other day for using pounds per acre and not uh, not plant density. What is the ideal plant density for canola? Seven to eight. Seven to eight plants per square foot. Four to six. Four to six plants per square foot. Yeah. Turns out canola is actually a very very nice plastic plastic. Uh, I guess the response to yield is is very nice in canola. You could you could uh, have these four to six. 
five to six and you may not see a huge uh, yield difference unless you have stress or flea beetles right so here we have uh, You'll be about three pounds, three to four pounds, five to six pounds, and around 10 pounds per acre that we have here. And I can tell you that the, uh, the very low plant density had the lowest yield, especially when you had no, no, uh, no seed treatment. And even if you sprayed, it, maybe you increased one bushel or half a bushel, so it wouldn't be worthwhile. Might as well just leave it unsprayed if you have a, if you have that low, if you, <clears throat> the, the best yield that we got last year was out of the, uh, the six, five, five pounds per acre when we had the neonic seed treatment. And uh, this seed came from Syngenta, so I'm not quite, I think it's Helix, but I, I don't know exactly what they, they put on it. It's one of the standard, at uh, the standard rate. So the, uh, the six plants or the uh, six kilogram, five pounds per acre, that would have been the, the best yield that we got with the seed treatment. Uh, spraying the foliar insecticide didn't quite uh, cut it as far as comparing it to the seed treatment. Uh, the 12, uh, the 10 pounds per acre, that actually had the very, very comparable yield even without any uh, foliar insecticide or any seed treatment. So it looks like uh, the, the old guys that, that were planting Canmola very thick in the Pacific Northwest 30, 40 years ago, uh, they, they had it right. So they were actually getting, getting pretty good yields. I guess the question is, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's economical to plant it now at that, at that rate. Are there any questions? Um, we probably have only a few minutes to, to look at some plots. Sure. You talked about the striped flea beetle. Are they all resistant to neonics or is it? Okay, I have correct that, that term. They're not resistant. They're just not, not affected by it. Because res resist resistance implies that, that we cause the resistance, right? That they develop it. Uh, for example, we do have, uh, the, I'm aware of only one example of an insect uh, that has developed resistance to insecticides in the prairies, or at least in the area. Anybody can tell me what that insect is and what crop? And Ken Both cannot answer. I was going to say, Ken cannot answer the question. Ligus. <laughs> uh, Ligus probably will develop it if we, if we use a lot because they develop insecticide very quickly. They have perpyritras in, in cotton. But the alfalfa weevil, which I, I thought Ken of, is too keen. Alfalfa weevil is uh, one that has, uh, there's a population by rosemary that has developed resistance to, to uh, pyrethroid insecticides and probably other things. Okay, that is uh, okay. I let me know if Pisibi is the same thing as Lumeter. I think it's, it is. It's the same. No, it's a no. different active ingredient. Oh, it's Pisibio different. Pisibio is different. Okay. Potenza is the same thing as Lumeter. Same active ingredient, but Pisibio is different. But it's, and it is effective on strikes. Okay, I. It's a Syngenta product. Syngenta product. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So have you got any Pisibio in your? No, no, we don't have any. We don't, we don't have any Vesivio in these trials here. So here we, we are basically looking at one or two chemicals, whatever Syngenta has put in there, in their, uh, which is a neonic, something like Helix, I think. And then we do the foliar with uh, disease, and then we have the seeding rate. So those are the, the, only, the only treatments that we have. Any other questions? Uh, otherwise, we could take a quick look at some of the plots. Uh, this is pretty long trial, so if we look at uh, plot 101, can we do this? Is it too big? Yeah, let's do it. So this is this is what uh, the the high the highest seeding rate looks like, and, it, and this one has the uh, fungicide plus the insecticide seed treatment. So this is where we expect to see one of the highest yields and also the highest cost, obviously. Uh, this year, like most of you have seen, there was, there was pretty good flea beetle pressure, which always makes entomologists quite happy because then we can actually do, do a test. I guess it's not the same way when the farmer is looking at it. But uh, we, uh, so if, if we get the same results as last year, this treatment would be about the same yield as having the, uh, the six plants per square foot with the seed treatment. 
this actually so it's not not a huge advantage if you're gonna plant 12 plants per square foot and put your money into seed then uh, just let the flea beetles do the thinning for you the uh with the diseases in the soil, though, you would still need the fungicide, even if yeah. you load the insecticide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, when I say citrine, I'm talking about insecticide. I should clarify that. Yeah, thank you. So if we look at the next plot, uh, 102, this one is the very low seeding rate. So three plants per square foot. And only with the, everything here has fungicide, so we don't plant any seed without fungicide seed treatments. So this is this is the uh, this is I guess worst case scenario, and this is where we expect to, to see the lowest yield. And I guess uh, Ken does a really good job at uh, irrigating and, and having proper fertility because we still had 57 bushels per acre in this treatment last year. The hand rope to clean it up? No, no hand. Uh, we have a really good technician who's an expert on weed science, uh, Randall Brand. I mean to get the plants down. No, no we, we, uh, hand count, yeah. okay. we, we do hand, hand, do a hand count, but the seating we is... We use our eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. The hand is just for pointing at them. <laughs> you. So, let's see, plot 103 is uh, <coughs> six, six plants per square foot. And this one has the fungicide and the insecticide. So, so this is where we saw the highest yield. And this would be comparable to planting 12 plants per square foot without the insecticide, foliar or insecticide seed treatment. So, and this one yielded 68 bushels per acre last year. Pretty high yield, so we, we have met the Canola Council goal of 52 bushels. <laughs> or Ken has. <laughs> how, much the water, how much water do you put in, I guess? Basically, turn it on and shut it off. Yeah, yeah, so there's lots and lots of water here. It's not 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 rainfall. Small this plots or yields can be higher. We've actually cracked 120 bushel canola on small pots with everything done right. Okay, I, I'm going to criticize our own studies now because you know we we do these plot studies so we learn something about how things work, but to learn how things work in reality, we need to do this in your farmers your field so um i guess ken ken in is doing fact, this we have a new study where we're looking for cooperators um we have a program that lewis barda heads up here at farming smarter called field tested and we're trying to be a coordinator for arm farm research and we're trying to build a, a long-lasting program around that premise is is how do you take what we learn in the small plots what everyone learns and then literally field test it because in that environment, there is just so much going on. There's a ton more variability, uh, but there's also a lot of data that we can generate. And how can we make uh, good use of that information? Just like uh, Hector struggles with variable data, that's a real challenge when we go to the field scale environment too, to be able to have any confidence in, in what's happening with that information. So we think that we've kind of developed a method that, that will provide the best opportunity to do a, a scientific evaluation of that project. So that's exactly what we're going to do is we're, we're going to try to mimic what Hector's learning in these studies and then go out into the field scale environment. So starting next year, we're going to be administering a number of trials across Alberta that will, we, one thing that we do have to do is, is not as many treatments because this would drive any farmer crazy to have 27 treatments in a field. So we're probably gonna have three to four treatments in the field. So if any of you are interested in, in and being part of that, uh, just drop us a line and we'll uh, look forward to crunching some numbers over the next number of years. Yes, and I'm gonna put in a shameless plug for my own field trial. We, we are on the fourth year of uh, validating the LIGOS thresholds in canola. So if, if you are about to spray LIGOS uh, in canola or know somebody, uh, give me a shout. If the person has a yield monitor in their combine, can save the data and more important, give me the data. And also uh, if they can leave check strips. We need four big check strips, the width of the sprayer and 100 meters long because uh, that's that's how big you need this plot. The challenge with these small plots, I'm going to show you the challenge in the next plot and then I will be done. Yeah. 
No, no, we, we spray herbicide. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So see the um, this these uh, plots that have the uh, the double yellow flags. This is a new treatment. We didn't have this last year, and uh, the uh, the uh, person leading this trial is Alejandro Costa Magna out of the University of uh, Manitoba, and he said, "Oh, we we need to have a, a treatment." where we keep the uh, flea beetle damage as close to zero as possible. And I, I, I told him, well, we, we already are doing that because we are spraying the other, other plots uh, that are supposed to spray at 25%. We spray them as long as we have to, like every week, pretty much. So we said, okay, this trial, we have, this treatment actually has, uh, uh, I hate to use the word, prophylactic spraying twice a week. And we do it just because we like to, to have uh, as much control and it doesn't look like we actually are going to have any differences from this to the 25 percent if you look at the at the plus you can clearly see that there is damage so even uh this was sprayed yesterday so don't don't eat the canola <laughs> it was sprayed yesterday uh with this is and we're going to spray it again probably this afternoon or tomorrow so we spray every every two three days and we basically are are trying to kill the flea beetles so this is a complete warfare Well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You know, these small, small plot trials. We have, uh, we have uh, 36 plots here all together. Uh, uh, I, I asked Ken for one acre plot, but he didn't want to give me one acre plot here. <laughs> we're already out of land. Yeah, so uh, we're using. that, if you want to buy us some land. <laughs> <laughs> so Hector, how bad were they here? Then? Uh, they, they, we reached the thresholds. Uh, we had 25.7 percent in in. Uh, pretty close to the to the to the uh, threshold so it should be a good study but the point I'm making is in small plots the flea beetles move around yeah, yeah and, and we just cannot get away from that uh, whereas if you're doing this in a large field you know you spray your flea beetles and hopefully you don't have as much immigration anymore uh, although sometimes the flea beetles come in waves and especially now that we have the two species you may kill most of the striped flea beetles when you spray early and then you might get a wave of uh, crucifer flea beetles coming later. I guess I'm, I'm doing my share of fear mongering now, sorry. <laughs> but Hector, you never look at the actual number of, of flea beetles, you just look at the damage. No, I, where are the sticky cars? Sorry, passed around. We do, we do that uh, in the sticky cars. And, and, uh, but you're right, you know, the sticky cars only give you an approximate numbers of uh, flea beetles. There's actually not a really good way to, to get the exact population count of flea beetles. Well, there is, but we, we will need 100 students working here day and night to, to, to collect it. You, you basically would have to find a way to, like uh, probably, I, I think a, a catapult would work really well. So you have a catapult there, throw a barrel here on each plot, and then uh, you have a, an actual density, and then you get everybody aspirating the insects that way. Um, otherwise, the, the sticky cars just give you an idea of the relative abundance. And we, once in a while, we get a bit of wind here, and then the sticky cars get covered with dirt, so they no longer catch flea beetles. Or sometimes you have so many flea beetles that in one hour you can get the sticky car completely covered with flea beetles, and then you no longer catch the rest of the flea beetles. Would, would you mind the feeding habits of the stripe versus the are they any different? No, they're, they're the same as far as the feeding. Just the time of feeding is different. Good question. That's as far as I know. No. Do you maybe want to comment, Hector, then on, and I, th and I think this relates to whether you're spraying early versus late, that the canola can grow out of it. Yeah. And you know, I know this year the early seeded stuff was hurt because of the frost, so it was kind of not moving very quickly. And I think the flea beetles came in and really caused damage. Whereas the later seeded stuff, it's just growing so fast that it can outgrow it. And also, could you comment on how do you actually rate that cotyledon? That what, how do you how do you visually pick 25%? And, and do you have any tips on that? Yes. So that's kind of a. I will need another half an hour to answer these two questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but, but just quickly, the, the, you know, the, the threshold is 25%, but we actually know that plants, and this is kind of general, even, even trees defoliated by a uh, forest and caterpillar, unless you get more than 50% defoliation of any plant, including pea leaf weevil, so don't spray for pea leaf weevil in peas if you only have 20%. Flea beetles will say 25% only because we know that the flea beetles can move in quickly and then you, suddenly you have 50%. We know from lots of studies that the plants actually can compensate 
and and survive uh, the the uh, maturity might be different though but as far as yield you can still get high yield or similar yield from 50 percent defoliation but uh, we, we set the threshold at 25 percent because the free bills can actually move in and, and do a lot of damage and in 2015 the first time we did this trial with ken we planted a uh, very late may and there were still some flea beetles around, but uh, the, the plants just, just grew so fast because uh, there was a lot of uh, irrigation and very nice hot weather. So yeah, the plants can grow and there's a lot of nutrients. So this applies to any, pretty much any insect plant interaction. If you have enough resources in the soil, fertilizer and water, and good temperature, good conditions, no diseases, then the plants usually can tolerate the insects. And in some cases, even having a few insects will actually boost the yield, which some, sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it's been shown with grasshoppers, uh, sepal beetles, ligus bugs, uh, in safflower, canola, many crops. You have one, a few insects, the plants get a bit of, uh, of uh, get the, I guess they're frightened. So, oh, I'm getting eaten. So they, instead of putting polis, they put more seeds. Uh, the second question was, what was the second part? So there's some tips on how to evaluate it. Oh yes, tips on how to evaluate. That's a, that's a kind of a tough one. Uh, the best best thing to do is I, I think uh, it's easy to say, but be objective because uh, I, I know that if it's your canola, you probably are going to see higher damage than it is. So, uh, try to train yourself, perhaps, uh, I think Syngenta has a bunch of n very nice cars that, that show the, the, uh, the ratings visually. We don't have an objective way of doing it, and, and it, it is possible we could, somebody one day will develop uh, an image analysis method where you scan the, the leaves, but that we're not there yet. Uh, so for now, I guess all you have to do is do what we do with the students. We do a lot of training with this. With these uh, cards, we use Ingenta's cards quite a bit. Uh, also, Julie Soroka has, uh, uh, if you Google Julie Soroka flea beetle rating, she has some nice uh, image analysis photographs. I think I have one of hers here, or maybe not. Yes, so you can pass this around. So. So I would do this and also get other people to trade your ratings and see how close you are. So we do this a lot with our students and we, we try to, uh, to uh, not have the same person do the same plus all the time. Uh, and, and we try to get a person to do a whole rep so that if there's any, we know there is going to be some bias, some, somebody will, will rate high, others will rate low. Uh, so there's, there's no easy answer to that. That should be it. I think I've gone way over time probably. <laughs> If you have any questions, uh, I'm going to be around uh, all day and also I work with uh, alfalfa weevils, uh, ligus bugs, cave seaport weevils, uh, I used to work with wisdom softly and Syrian leaf beetles, so if you have questions about those things, I might try to answer them. Hector, just real quick, one more question. Cabbage seed pod weevil, in terms of increasing in numbers and decreasing in population over the last few years, what have you what have you sensed out there? Last, last year it was low and I think it had to do with uh, we had a couple of years of uh, kind of hot conditions in the summer and they don't seem to do as well when we have very hot dry conditions at the wrong time when they are pupating in the soil or coming out of the pods. Uh, we were hoping that I guess from the farmer's point of view we had a very cold February so we would expect a bit lower numbers. We saw that with the leaf weevil. We have an overwintering study and it looked like they didn't survive in the alfalfa field but they survived in the tree shelters a little better. Join me in thanking Hector and we can load up.